This is the worst case I've ever seen as far as the facts go. Fathers are made to protect, to serve, to comfort. But comfort comes from a warm hug, not from sharpened steel and a hardened heart. It was the 18th of March, 2018, a day of spring, which in every expected scenario would be a time of life and birth, a time of joy, serenity, and radiance. But no one could have expected a radiance of blood red and a serenity of dead silence. For it was on this day that a father, a parent, protector would instead take the steps in destroying, reaving and spilling blood, ripping his family from the world and his girlfriend and his child's innocence from existence, forever marking him as a monster. Ronnie O'Neill III, who was at the time of the murder 29, was dating his partner Kenyatta, age 33, whom he'd had two children with. While everything at first glance seemed normal, with what was seen as a regular family, it would not remain so as tragedy, anguish and misery would soon strike this family, ripping it in half and burning one side completely away. At approximately 11.43 p.m. in Riverview, Hillsborough County, Florida, an emergency call had been made as the nearby authorities were notified by a call from a distressed woman whose fear-ridden and desperate cries for help were drowned out by the booming, horrifying sounds of another in the background. A man, or rather an evil masquerading as a man, was heard to be screaming Allah Akbar, only for the female caller to respond with I'm so sorry Ronnie in an anguished and horrified tone, something akin to a plea for mercy. But it would soon be clear there would be no mercy tonight, not by the hands of a man. The call was quickly filled with screams from the male in the call, as phrases such as, she killed me, and don't come outside, call 911 now, could be heard thundering in the background, as though the sounds of death were drawing closer and tragedy was imminent. Shortly after this call of distress, the authorities received yet another call, only this time to hear Ronnie's malicious and vicious voice. He began to state directly to the authorities that he had been attacked by what he could only describe as white demons, then stating that his partner Kenyatta was one of these demons, referring to her as Kiki, before confessing to taking Kenyatta's life in such cold and evil yet distressed manner. Ronnie had then provided the address where this horror had unravelled, be it out of guilt or genuine fear for his own well-being. The authorities had then without hesitation mobilised, arriving at the scene of this hellish and haunting nightmare, only to come across a woman laid flat in front of the house next door. They rushed to ascertain her well-being, only to suddenly witness the beginning of a house fire originating from the address mentioned in the call, almost as if to be a warning of what had happened and what was yet to come. The authorities had then begun to force their way inside, intent on preventing the situation from becoming any more dire, only to witness O'Neill step out from the opening garage, filled with hate, fury and malice. The authorities had tried so many times to convince O'Neill to come quietly, as to avoid any more bloodshed and heartbreak, but it was for now, as O'Neill had blood on his mind and malevolence in his intent. O'Neill had defied and refused numerous pleas and demands from the authorities, opting to instead continue his rampage of fatality. No apparent alternative to this plight, the authorities had made the choice of a forced apprehension as they unleashed a barrage of voltage upon O'Neill in order to pacify this horrific monster-made man. As they apprehended the would-be murderer, they restrained O'Neill into their holding vehicle, only to hear the haunting bellows of Allah Akbar once again giving praise to God expecting to be revered and admired for the atrocities he had committed that night. All that finality, that loss, that injustice, it seemed right to him. In O'Neill's eyes, this was not savagery, but duty. Where one would see heartlessness, he saw righteousness. Terror be the man who smiles in the face of his misdeeds. At the same time of this man's sinister screams and depraved attitude towards all that have transpired, the county's fire and rescue service had successfully made it into the still burning house to find O'Neill's son, eight-year-old Ronnie O'Neill IV, covered in charred skin and wounded several times over, presumably by his father, the last person a child expects such an unspeakable act from. When Ronnie O'Neill IV had been treated for his unjust and severe injuries, a heartbroken and despairing Ronnie had stated, My father shot my mother, something a child should never have to utter. What would seem a living nightmare to most was now his reality, 
As he was taken to a nearby hospital, with his wounds and injuries treated, the search continued in the house of horror, leading to even more monstrosity. O'Neill's daughter, nine-year-old Ron Nevea O'Neill, had been discovered sustaining the same damage, the exact same stabs and lacerations the son had sustained, but to a more drastic length, as the little girl was pronounced dead at the scene, the beginning of the worst of this tragedy. It was then that the woman found previously in the night was confirmed to be Kenyatta, the original person to report the disaster that was unfolding before her eyes. Kenyatta was found dead at the scene, both her and her child ripped from the world, root and stem. And so, what was supposed to be a night in the spring like any other, became a night in which blood was spilled by the gallon, and hearts shattered and betrayed. A night where Protractor became the destroyer, where a father became a butcher. It would not be until three dreadful, wearisome years later in which some semblance of justice would be wrought upon Ronnie O'Neill III for his cruel, unforgivable crimes against his own blood. Blood he was supposed to protect and nurture. What had gone wrong that night? What had caused a father to turn on the woman he loves and the children he sired? Such an act would drive most insane and shake the resolve of even the strongest of people. Yet O'Neill remained steadfast in the view that he was in the right and that what had transpired that dreadful night should not have been held against him. O'Neill would not go gently into the good night. He would thrash and struggle against his just desert as he implied the evidence was altered and tampered with in an effort to justify the atrocities that he had committed, stating that the evidence he had would show law enforcement tampered with evidence to meet their high burden of proof, citing that it was not originally enough and that they had decided to alter the evidence against O'Neill's favour. While O'Neill was fervent in his belief that the evidence was not a true retelling of the events that had taken place, said evidence was considered by the prosecution as resolute and accurate in what had transpired, showing that all occurrences were O'Neill's fault and only O'Neill's. The evidence in question had displayed that not only was Ronnie O'Neill IV's retelling of events true, but that O'Neill IV was in fact a confirmed victim in what can only be described as a living nightmare, something taken fresh from the pages of a horror story. O'Neill IV's first words to be spoken that night were not of concern for his own well-being or a cry for help, but a reality-shaking, heart-gripping statement of, my daddy killed my mummy, something no child should ever need to say. O'Neill III had tried to rebuke this statement, offering instead his own perspective of the bloodied and haunting night. O'Neill III professed that little Ronnie O'Neill IV had not seen his father take his mother's life, nor that he had seen how he had taken it via the usage of a shotgun. However, these claims would be refuted by both the neighbours of O'Neill and detectives who had analysed the gut-wrenching scene. O'Neill claimed that his son was lying about the massacre, and that what had occurred was far different from what was reported. This would eventually be refuted, as O'Neill IV had confirmed once more that O'Neill III had attempted to take his son's life by method of laceration. While O'Neill III's attorneys had attempted to justify the bone-chilling actions their client had wrought upon this innocent family by referring to what is known as the Stand Your Ground Law, it was for nout, as his crimes would far outweigh any defence he and his defenders could possibly offer. For there is some darkness that lingers no matter what light you try and facade it with. It was on the 21st of June 2021 that O'Neill III had finally faced the justice that he'd wrought upon himself. O'Neill was found guilty of various charges ranging from first degree and attempted first degree murder all the way to child abuse and arson. The fire he sparked and the blood he spilled finally caught up to him, ensnaring him in a consequence of his own evil doings. Not even two days later, on the 23rd of the month, was O'Neill's retribution and reckoning finally hammered upon him. This demon of a man finally cast back to hell as three life sentences were declared against this animal. Any chance of parole was denied, for such a beast should never walk the earth again. As O'Neill III was finally locked behind bars forever and a day, life for his son who had suffered and struggled would improve. Not only would O'Neill IV be adopted out of the kindness of Detective Mike Blair, but he would undergo the process of leaving that dead life and devastating night behind, subsequently changing his last name to Blair in honour of his new guardian, gaining a new family in the process of finding sense and love where there would otherwise be heartbreak. What pushes a man this far? 
What catalyst could possibly exist to send the man over the edge and cause the death of half his family, marking him forever as a monster? Does this evil exist in everyone? Is O'Neill unique in the atrocities he committed? Some could argue that he was a religious zealot, whilst others would suggest a streak of insanity suddenly emerging from the darkest depths of his soul. But nonetheless, it cannot be argued that O'Neill was anything less than a monster.